Hi there. Putin just jailed Alexei Navalny for two years and eight months. And there's no need to talk about what the official charges were. Jailing Navalny was a political decision that had nothing to do with justice. The court is Putin, the judge is Putin, the decision is Putin's. Three weeks ago, Navalny's team revealed to the world the palace that Putin was quietly building for his retirement. Nothing wrong with planning your retirement, except that the billions spent on the palace that was Russian taxpayer money and kickbacks from corrupt businessmen. Navalny's documentary was viewed more than 100 million times in two weeks. Putin was not happy. He was forced to confront the questions regarding his mansion. Embarrassing. Из того, что там указано в качестве моей собственности, ни мне, ни моим близким родственникам не принадлежит what does this all mean for Russia and the Russian people? Well, Putin is losing his legitimacy and the only way for him to compensate is by responding with brutal force. Already back in the summer of 2020, official polls showed that half of all Russians didn't support the extension of Putin's presidency past 2024. What would the polls look like today, after learning about the modus life of Putin with palaces and vineyards worth billions? In recent weeks, Russia saw unprecedented numbers of people out on the snowy streets, not just in Moscow, but in regions. The photos of Putin's mansion, complete with 16 underground floors, a hookah bar and private theater, pushed the country over the edge. Navalny's documentary reopened a years-old wound. Russia's average income has been stagnant for almost 10 years. Ordinary people don't have social security or a future to look forward to. Putin keeps offering Russia the opportunity to enjoy this stability indefinitely. Meanwhile, he spent four annual healthcare budgets of an average region to build a palace for himself. And if before Putin could ask people to be patient and help out the national cause by tightening their belts, now he can't. Simply put, Russians now know that Putin's toilet brush is worth an average monthly salary. This dissatisfaction is just the beginning, and Putin only really has one hand to play – blunt force. Blunt force against his own people. If you ask any Russian today whether Russia won or lost the Second World War, you'd be laughed at. Obviously, we beat the fascists. But wait a second, why do the biggest cities in Russia look like this? This is St. Petersburg, a monument to Russian culture, literature and art. And this is what Putin's St. Petersburg looks like these days. Here. Special forces are chasing peaceful protesters on the ice of Amur Bay. Why? Because people dared to voice their opinion. In one Siberian city, the police surrounded protesters like a pack of hyenas circling their prey. In Kazan, a city near Moscow, detained demonstrators are thrown into the snow with their hands behind their heads. All over the country, thousands are detained, arrested, beaten with bats, shot at with air rifles and sprayed with tear gas. Main streets of large cities are closed off, metro service is restricted, leaving your house is now considered a crime. Does this look like a free and unoccupied country? What enemy is the Russian government fighting? Its own citizens. Citizens whose rights the government is supposed to protect. Citizens who now realize their future and prosperity have been siphoned off, not for the chance of a better society, but to enrich those who have been enriching themselves for years. These guys aren't building job-creating businesses or anything remotely productive. They're just buying up the most techy and expensive European stuff they can find, all to furnish the palace of their modern-day Tsar. More than 5,000 were arrested in the recent protests, not as criminals, but as political prisoners, just like Alexei Navalny jailed for expressing their opinion of Putin and his government. One of the top priorities for the Russian opposition now will almost certainly be the freeing of political prisoners. I myself was a political prisoner and spent 10 years in prison. From personal experience, serving a politically motivated sentence is tough without outside support. The main goal of your jailers is to break you by cutting off information, convincing you that nobody needs you and that the world has forgotten all about you. It's vital to have a team on the outside, writing letters, finding funds for lawyers and holding rallies to highlight the injustice inherent in the system. Political prisoners are not criminals, and they don't just represent the average citizen, they are the average citizen.
Now it's plainer than ever that any opposition to Putin is seen as an immediate danger. How did it get to this point? Peaceful protests in any other country would be a standard weekend activity. But in Putin's Russia, it calls for special forces in the streets. Why? Because Putin's Russia is still the Russia of the past, the Russia of Tsars, of the voiceless masses and of brutal repression. We've had enough. Another focus of the opposition might be to put pressure on those who prop up Putin's regime, perhaps most easily by expanding the Magnitsky Act and advocating for Europe to draft similar legislation. People who violate human rights in Russia, people who are sponsors or beneficiaries of its regime, should not enjoy the benefits of democratic states. These criminals are embezzling and repressing their own people, all while educating their children at the best schools in Europe and the States, buying up foreign property and stashing euros and dollars abroad. Apparently, the country they helped create doesn't even serve their best interests. It's important to seek sanctions against high-level officials, the captains and lieutenants in Putin's political mafia. Putin's cabinet and his closest circle of friends are one and the same. Because of that, they're the very people with the most to lose. They've been stealing and profiting from a criminal regime for decades. Maybe it's time they had their belts tightened. They got their Mediterranean villas by being loyal to Putin. They lose them for the same reason. Alexei Navalny's poisoning, his arrest, Putin's repressive reaction to the documentary and protests – these are the events that will shape Russia's future political landscape. For now, Russians face two simple yet profound questions – first, whether to support a repressive dictator or not, second, what to do when he leaves. The first question can and should be answered at the next parliamentary elections later this year. Candidates should make clear their positions on the issues of Putin's use of force, corruption, poisoning. Putin can't jail everyone. The second question is simple – free and fair elections. Elections with honest candidates, freely expressing their vision for the country. Elections where Russians can actually have democracy. I see this as my personal top priority. Putin doesn't want to give up his power. Like any dictator, life after power is rarely pleasant. But the more he clings to power, the more mistakes he makes. The situation is changing very quickly. It's impossible to predict which palace, mansion, vineyard or yacht will be the last straw for the Russian people. There's a chance we might need the after Putin plan sooner than we think. That's why we should be working on it now. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and share. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell to stay updated.